Hello, I'm Inventor Dan Zen, and I'm going to take you through the code for the Goose Multi-Touch Emulator example. We've already had a video talking about the Goose code in general, as well as an overview video that shows all this working. Just as a reminder, here is it working. We've got a, um, a cursor on one computer and a, a cursor on the other computer. We can uh, drag like so or uh, stretch like so. We're going to take a look at the code that, um, that uh, does that. It's available here in Flash. This is the Goose example FLA and here's the Goose example AS document class that goes along with that. It's well documented. Talks about the two parts of a processor and an emulator and how to use the code. There's an example of the XML that comes in. Now we were just using the code from our emulators but you can pass in code from uh, from your own multi-touch table or, or what have you. Here are the various methods that are available and we'll take a look down in the code at those uh, properties and, and so forth. This bit here just talks about how nice it was um, when I first experienced a multi-touch here in Flash without having to have um, a multi-touch device or a blob detection table, etc. Now that of course emulates if you want this to go out to the real world. In the end you'll have to have your own multi-touch data coming in from such a table or a device, but you can just plug that in quite easily. So let's take a look. We um, oh, just up here we import com.danzen.interfaces.goose.star. So that's the goose package. That means that your com folder or this com folder will have to be in a folder in your class path. So you might have a classes folder in your class path. Put the com folder in that. And do not add com to your class path um, if you want this to work properly. Okay, down here we create a mygoose variable that's going to hold our goose object and a mygoose data variable which holds our goose data object. In our constructor we create our uh, goose data, new goose data. We pass in the name of our application. If you're using the Danzen emulators, when you start up the mouse node it'll ask you for an application name. You would put the same name. If you leave it at default you run the risk of other people who are using this uh, providing cursors, <laughs> surprisingly, <laughs> for your application. So you probably want that to be unique. It might make sense if you use this a lot for you to get your own Robin, and this is discussed earlier, uh, install your own uh, emulators and then you can probably leave it at default with worrying about other people uh, getting in there. So that's our goose data. Uh, we add an event listener, event.change, and we call feed goose whenever that data changes. Here we are creating a new goose object, and we add that to the stage as that represents our cursors. We add press listener. Uh, these are our own special types of listeners. Um, it's a goose event pressed down on my pick. So um, when we press down on my pick, we will call call press down. When we press move on my pick, it uh, means once we press down on the pick, if we move our pr our finger um, as long as it's down, we will call press move or call call press move. <laughs> uh, we add a put down listener. Put down is a little bit different. Um, then press down. Put down gets triggered when all people who are currently um, moving or scaling the picture have stopped moving or scaling. Then um, put down is called. So you see how that's a bit different. Uh, there's also a pick up, which is the first time any object is picked up to, um, to follow a cursor or to scale um, the object. Here are some other listeners as well. These are uh, in the traditional format of add event listener. Um, touch anywhere, you know, touch down, touch move, touch up. Uh, there we're not passing in a certain thing to touch on, so that just captures any touch. A touch, by the way, uh, like a press, we don't have a press here, but we, we do activate a press listener down below when we do the restore button. But a press or a touch is a, is like a click, so it's a press down and a press up 
uh, within a certain amount of time and that can be set in the goose class. So uh, these aren't used in the, uh, in the application but you can trace some messages just to see that they work down below. Here we are setting some initial conditions for the picture so that we can restore it. Here's feed goose. Feed goose is being uh, called by that event, the change event on the um, goose data class or object. And all we do is take e.target.xml data, so that's our goose uh, data object. We take the XML data property from it because that's what's changing every time goose data changes is the XML data property. That's your multi-touch data. We pass that into an update method on Goose. So if you have your own multi-touch data, you would not use uh, Goose data or the emulator. You would have your own and you would pass it into an up the update method of your Goose object, just like this. Here's what happens when we press down. We make um, the object that we press down on. So e.obj tells us what object was made, and this is our event object. And e.cursor tells us what cursor um, caused that event. So we say, hey, make that object start following this cursor. Now, the object might already be following other cursors, but this just sort of adds this cursor into that mix. We can say how we want it to follow, that's damping. So if we have damping set at 1, it follows it very quickly. If it's set at 0, it won't follow at all. Point 0.1 is nice, it, it allows that smoothing. Multi-touch, sometimes the data comes in in a little bit of a staggered, staggered way, so um, the smoothing makes it glide nicely. And we can say how we want this to follow. Uh, goose.drag average means um, uh, average out, so all the cursors are trying to make this thing follow at once, that's the default. There's also a drag override, which means that the last cursor to press the object is the cursor that it will follow. It won't follow any of the other ones. It overrides the rest of them. But if the next cursor comes along, then it's going to be the, the cursor it follows. Drag locked locks your cursor so that you're the only cursor um, while you've got to press down and move. It's the only cursor it will follow. Any other cursors that try and pick it up won't be allowed to. So that's kind of neat functionality there. That's the follow. Uh, there's also the scaling and we say which cursor we're using to uh, get in on the scaling and the object that we're scaling. Again, the, the damping on that. True means proportional versus non-proportional and goose, um, the, the goose registration here is goose registration average means um, from an average of where the cursors have pressed down that's where it will scale from. You can also scale from the center of the object or from its registration point. The press move is just going to, if the um, it's tracking to find out if you've scaled it so small that it should turn it into a crumple, so it goes to and stops on a second crumple frame. The um, call put down is when everybody's dropped it, because if you're moving something and one person drops it, you don't want it to go in the garbage if other people are still moving it around, so you have to call the call put down, and that means that everybody has finally put it down, the very last person's finally put it down, in which case we check to see if it's hitting the garbage, and we uh, throw it out and start a, um, our restore button. The restore button has an add press listener, goose event dot press event on it, and on the restore button, and we um, call restore picture. The restore picture restores the picture to its normal place and it removes the press listener, um, etc. So isn't that neat? And then here's those other uh, touch events that we had. I'm Inventor Dan Zen. This has been a look through the code at Goose Flash. Um, you can download uh, the Goose zip here on the site. If you use the site, uh, please add your link and you're welcome to donate. I'm inventor Dan Zen. All the best.